you are in for a treat today because this is, I think, one of the most interesting papers I've read in a bit. And maybe that's saying a bit much, but it's because in this paper, we have models learning how to do reinforcement learning. That's right, not models that do reinforcement learning, but models that learn how to do reinforcement learning. This paper is work from Michael Laskin, Lu Yu Wang, and colleagues from DeepMind. And as I take you through the details of this work, I really hope that I can explain this paper in a way that gives you the same sense of awe I had when I first read through it. To do that, I actually want to start off by telling you a little theory of mine that I think explains what I love about this paper. And that theory goes like this. Oftentimes in the field of machine learning, it seems like there are cycles. Cycles where we don't quite know the best way to solve some problem. So we end up trying a bunch of different solutions by hard coding certain things like model structure or some sorts of human biases. And eventually we find a pretty good solution framework. But the way these cycles tend to end are not with those solutions, but with new ways of learning solutions. Ways that allow the original solution to be learned, or perhaps an even better one through a more general learning framework. And I'm showing one example of that here where we sort of have this problem in the past of how we work with images. People came up with convolutional neural networks as a solution, but eventually our meta learning methods were able to reproduce convolutional neural networks without hard coding these spatial constraints. And I think, I think that's what I see in this paper, that we are sort of getting to this final step of learning how to learn, and that hopefully this will lead to new methods that can do better than the state of the art, our sort of hard-coded ways of doing RL. I mean, just imagine if instead of spending countless hours trying to derive reinforcement learning algorithms through math, experiments, and endless trial and error, if instead we could have an agent do all of that for us. Now, whether or not this paper actually lives up to those wild expectations that they set, I don't know. As always, I'll talk through some of the strengths and also what I think some of the weaknesses of this paper are, but I wanted to start off with what I think is the big picture here and what I hope this line of work continues to evolve towards down the line. The last thing I'll get into before we dive into the meat of this paper is I wanted to thank ClearML for sponsoring this video. ClearML offers an end-to-end -end platform for ML ops where you can do everything from tracking experiments to automating an entire machine learning pipeline through to deployment. Here's the code for one of my current projects and with just an extra several lines of code, I can integrate it with ClearML. ClearML. And with that, we can now pull up a dashboard and see the progress of my experiment as it runs. Here, I'm just logging the loss because I wanted to get this done in a few seconds, but there is a lot more you can do with this. But really, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You can also create entire pipelines that pull in different versions of your data sets, run hyperparameter sweeps, automatically set up new environments. And because of that last point, ClearML has no problem with scaling. As I run many experiments in my own research, I personally love some of the features that help me with that. For example, I love how ClearML not only tracks code version, but also uncommitted Git changes, which is very nice. And also how through the dashboard, I can inject configs into my experiments, which means I don't have to constantly be modifying my code to run a bunch of new experiments. If that sounds like something you're interested in, you can try out their product for free by following the link in the description below to clear.ml. Now let's get into this actual paper. Looking at this figure on the very first page, we can actually get a really good idea of how this algorithm works because the whole thing is surprisingly simple, which I definitely think is a good thing, by the way. This whole algorithm can essentially be decomposed into three steps. To start with step one, we are going to need a task or more specifically, a set of tasks. So to give an example of something simple, this could be a grid world where in each task, the goal is placed in a different location. So for task number one, the goal may be to reach this tile, but for task number two, maybe the agent needs to reach this other tile. That is the prerequisite. What we do in step one is actually very simple. We take each of these tasks and we learn to solve them with some reinforcement learning algorithm. As far as I can tell, pretty much any reinforcement learning algorithm will do so long as it can solve the task. In fact, as we will see later in the paper, they use A3C, DQN, and UCB, all of which are different but well-known reinforcement learning algorithms. Then as the RL agent learns to solve the task, we save the whole history of the rollouts. So this includes sequences of observations, actions, and rewards, as you can see here in the figure on the left. One thing to note is that this is the entire history, including all episodes in sequential order. Concluding step one, now we can dive into step two. And it's almost kind of laughable how simple this second step is. All you do is get a giant transformer and you train on samples of sequences from those previous histories 
trying to predict the next action whenever one comes up. If you aren't familiar with transformers, they're essentially just a type of neural network that works well for sequences. So if you feed in these previous trajectories, you should be able to predict the next token in the sequence, which in our case is going to be an action. Finally, in step three, you can grab a new unseen task, start feeding the observations into your transformer, predict the next action, take that action in the environment, and watch as your agent learns how to maximize the reward, just like a reinforcement learning agent would. Wait, that, is that all? Why would that work? Am I missing something? Maybe you're thinking that, well, yeah, that's pretty much the whole algorithm, though I admit I did leave out one very crucial detail here. And that crucial detail is in step two, where we're training the transformer. Well, remember I said we need a transformer with a big input size? Well, to be more specific, we need a transformer with an input size that can hold parts of multiple subsequent trajectories. In other words, it should be pretty big. <laughs> because what is happening here? Well, to explain exactly what's happening here, let's first review what happens when a normal reinforcement agent is learning in some environment. In this case, we start with some agent and we also have some environment. The environment will give some observation to the agent. The agent will take an action in the environment, which will then update the environment. This process will keep repeating until the end of the episode or the end of this rollout. And then up here, we have some RL algorithm, for example, PPO, which will update the agent based on the previous episode in order to maximize reward. And this update right here by the RL algorithm is what we call the policy improvement operator. It is the function that takes the weights of the agent or the neural network and updates them such that it will do better in the next episode. So now if we go back to our original problem, thinking about how we have a transformer that can look at multiple subsequent episodes and see how the policy changes from episode to episode, well then theoretically, so long as our model is powerful enough, it should be able to learn what the policy improvement operator is, or at the very least, how to approximate it. And this is the core of what this paper brings to the table. The idea that by looking at updates between episodes, we can learn RL algorithms. To maybe clarify this a bit more, we can also briefly take a look at some pseudocode for this. As I mentioned before, you can see that this is roughly broken up into three steps, one, two, and three. First, the RL algorithm is run collecting a data set of trajectories or a learning history. From there, subsequences of the history are sampled and actions are predicted to update the model. And finally, a new random set of out of distribution tasks are sampled and the transformer is used to predict actions. And the idea is that the actions it will predict will be actions that follow the policy improvement operator from episode to episode, meaning they are actions that will slowly get better and better. Putting a wrap on this, they call this whole algorithm algorithm distillation or AD for short. Also, sorry for the quick interruption, but if you've been enjoying this so far and you're interested in this sort of thing, consider subscribing to the channel. I cover a whole lot of big papers to keep you up to date and also some smaller, more niche papers to introduce you to new ideas. That's it, let's get back into the video. With an understanding of how this algorithm works, we can now start moving towards the evaluation. For the evaluation, the authors use four different environments in total. And the play in this video is to go through those one at a time with their corresponding results and a bit of my personal thoughts and takeaways. The first environment we have is a 100 trial adversarial bandit. If you aren't familiar with bandits, it's this setup where you have a set of what are essentially slot machines with each slot machine or you know bandit giving a different distribution of rewards when you pull the lever. The idea being that over the course of 100 steps, the agent should explore and try out many different arms multiple times to try and figure out which one gives the highest reward on average. For our set of training environments, the bandits have been set up so that the odd numbered arms have higher rewards the majority of the time. So if I have four bandits here in my example, the first and third would likely always give a reward of zero, and the other two would usually give some higher reward. Or maybe the numbers aren't exactly that, but that's the gist. Um, even from the future here, I'm just now realizing I completely messed this up. I should have put the positive rewards under one and three, not under zero and two, so sorry, I'm going to mess that up for the rest of the video, but uh, I, yeah, I, I, you're not crazy, I'm crazy. <laughs> During evaluation time, the distribution can be altered, but we'll get to that part in a short bit. Here we can see the results of evaluation in that environment for four different algorithms. Each of the different colored bars represents a different distribution of rewards during evaluation. First, let's go through what each of these algorithms are, and then we can take a look at what these different colored bars mean. We start off with AD, but we're going to skip the explanation because that's what we just explained, and now jump to RL squared. Jumping down here a little bit, we should be able to find an explanation. This one is probably the most important because it is the most similar to AD in the aspect that it looks over multiple episodes. However, the key differences here are threefold. The first thing is that RL squared uses an LSTM instead of a transformer. 
The second difference is that RL squared uses a reinforcement learning objective to maximize multi-episodic reward, as opposed to AD, which is just using supervised learning to imitate actions provided by a predefined RL policy. So in summary, RL squared is actually reinforcement learning, whereas AD is just supervised learning over reinforcement learning. And then the last main difference is that RL squared learns online, whereas AD does all of its initial learning with an offline data set. And to summarize the whole algorithm of RL squared, essentially what it does is it is an RL problem of trying to maximize the reward of some set of environments, but the reward function covers multi-episodes. If we scroll up to the other evaluation algorithms, we will see that the next one they use here is the RL squared transformer. Now, as I mentioned down here, RL squared typically uses an LSTM. So this is just a simple variant that switches out that LSTM for a transformer. Um, so I don't think we need to cover that. That's really the only difference there. And then the final one we see here is ED, which stands for expert distillation. This is just where they gather a set of quote unquote expert trajectories and then learn to predict actions from trajectory sequences, I'm guessing using a transformer. So it's similar to AD in the sense that they are just using supervised learning to predict what the next action should be. However, the core difference here is that the data set for AD is a reinforcement learned set of episodes, whereas for ED, the history is not a history of learning, but just a set of expert examples. And this is basically just behavior clothing for those of you that are familiar with that. Now back to these results, I mentioned that each different colored bar here has a different meaning. The red bars are how the algorithm performs on a set of in-distribution training tasks. And that means that these are bandit tasks where the rewards are primarily distributed over the odd numbered bandit arms just as during training. In this case, all algorithms learn fairly well. ED does struggle a little bit, but it still learns somewhat. Next, if we move our eyes to take a look at the blue bars, we are now going into off-distribution territory because our evaluation environments now have rewards distributed uniformly across all bandits, not just under the odd bandit arms. Here, all the algorithms beside ED are, again, still working fairly well. But things get really interesting when we look at the green bars, which is the performance when the reward is now primarily distributed across the even number bandit arms. And remember, this is the complete opposite of what we did in training, where it was only basically under the odd numbered bandit arms. So to do well in this, these algorithms are going to have to be able to adapt completely to out of distribution data. And in this case, you can see that each of these algorithms, aside from AD right here, really just fail completely and AD still does fairly well. So why is this? Setting expert distillation aside, I really want to focus on the difference between AD and RL squared, because those are the two more similar and also more interesting algorithms. The idea behind both of them is to learn an RL algorithm. So what is it that AD is doing that RL squared isn't? And the answer to this question really comes down to the specific goals of each algorithm. The goal of RL squared is to learn a reinforcement learning algorithm that can maximize the reward of all tasks within its training distribution. And it does do that, hence the red bars here being high. But let's think about the ways it could actually go about that in this specific environment. To think about this, let's go back up to my example over here of a few bandits. The perhaps obvious and ideal way to a human is to check a few different bandits until you find something that works. So maybe we go from zero to one, to two, to three, and so on. And we keep doing this until we are relatively confident. And eventually we realize it looks like two is probably the best one here. So we're just gonna keep pulling that over and over again to maximize our reward. But because in the training set, the reward is pretty much always under odd numbered bandits, really a more optimal strategy is to only try pulling different odd numbered arms and completely ignore the even ones. Now, maybe the first like 10 times I do this, right? I go to the zeroth one, the first one, the second one, and I keep doing this uh, because I don't know, you know, my first time doing this where they're gonna be. But after 10 times, I'm like, okay, every single time it's been under zero and two. So I'm just gonna try pulling zero and two a few times. And then from those, I'm gonna decide which one's the best one. This is really the optimal strategy because you don't need to waste time because at every step you could be getting reward or you could be getting exploring, right? So in the first strategy where we're always looking at all of these, we're wasting time at one and three, where in the training set, we don't need to do that. The optimal strategy is to never look at those, but just to look at zero and two. So this algorithm to just look at the odd numbered arms is the more optimal algorithm. So if the environment changes, it's a natural consequence that RL squared will start performing worse. In other words, RL squared is the more optimal algorithm 
for the training set because you know we're not training it to do any sort of out of distribution generalization. So going back to AD, why does AD not fall into the same trap? Well, it's because remember the goal of AD is not to maximize reward. It's to imitate its training data. And the training data we gave it was using a more general reinforcement learning algorithm, UCB to be specific. Hence, this is really all possible because we had a general RL algorithm in the first place, whereas RL squared had to start from nothing. One way to summarize this is we can say that AD is essentially learning our bias towards solving problems in a particular way. Hopefully that made sense because it's a really key point here, which are really neat and I think have larger implications for the future of this work. Figure four gives us our next set of results, but as you might notice, we are using different environments here. So let me quickly go over those so we can then take a look. The first environment they talk about here is Darkroom, and this is kind of just like the grid world I was telling you about earlier. We have some sort of grid world, and then in this grid, we have some agent that is looking around and it's looking for a goal. So the goal might be over here. And the catch here is that the goal is invisible, which means that to do this, you know, the agent has to explore because, well, you know, how else is it supposed to find an invisible goal? <laughs> we also have two variants of this, dark room hard and dark key to door. These are exactly what they sound like. Hard is, I think, just a bigger room, whereas key to door means that the agent first has to find a key to unlock a door, but the key and the door are also invisible, making this quite difficult. The last environment we have here is water maze. In water maze, we have a little picture of it if we go back up here, and it's essentially just a 3D continuous version of this grid world where you have your agent that's running around in this 3D world, and it's trying to find some invisible goal. Now, taking a look back at these results, we can see the performance performance of several algorithms over several thousand steps of learning. You should now be familiar with AD, though note that for AD, the figure here is not showing the offline pre-training, but rather the in-context learning, which is phase three of the algorithm. We also have ED and RL squared again, along with a new baseline, and this is the source algorithm. And what the source algorithm is, is if you remember from earlier how AD works in step one, remember we need to collect data using an RL algorithm for it to learn on. Well, the source algorithm is just that algorithm. Whatever RL algorithm was used to learn in the environment from scratch. Here, I believe these source algorithms are a mix of A3C and DQN, both pretty popular and well-known RL algorithms. So looking at these results now, something should stick out like a sore thumb immediately, and that is how much faster AD is learning than everything else. I mean, it is completely outclassing these other results. And this should be surprising, right? Because of the fact that, remember, AD was trained to imitate the source algorithm. So why or how is it doing so much better? And there is an explanation for this, and it actually has to do with the implementation of the source algorithms. For both of the A3C and DQN implementations used in this paper, multiple actors that all share the same model are running in parallel. And then periodically, data is gathered from all the actors to make one big update to the network. The multi-episode samples used to train AD do not sample from the history as a whole, but rather from the histories of individual actors. This seemingly minor detail is actually very important here. To understand why, think about the case where you have three different actors that are generating 100 episodes each in parallel. I'll illustrate part of this right here, where I have three different actors, each in a different color, and each producing a number of episodes. So red E1 would be the first episode of the first actor, and green E2 would be the second episode of the third actor. If we combine these in chronological order as the training process would, we would get something like this. Note that the RL model is not constantly updating though, but rather updating once every three episodes, once each actor has given back an episode. So if AD were to train on this sequence down here, it would try to improve once every three episodes. Let's look at where the updates lie if instead we just look at the history of the first agent. From the perspective of AD, where would the updates be happening here? Well, they would be between E1 and E2, just like it is up here, and between E2 and E3, just as it is here. So the updates, you know, these are the same updates the key difference here is that because we're only looking at the episodes from one agent, from the perspective of AD, which is looking at these in chronological order, it's going to look like this is improving every single episode as opposed to every third episode. Hence, because it's trying to imitate this, AD will learn more quickly because it's trying to make improvements every single episode. Another way to put this is that if we have in agents and we are using this type of parallel learning scheme, then our algorithm will be trying to learn in times faster than our source algorithm. If we go back up to the experiment over here, the dark room environments were trained with, I believe, 100 actors, whereas Water Maze used 16 actors, which is very different from one, right? So we can see now why we're getting these huge speed ups. And I'm going to be honest, I think this is kind of awesome. 
It's a very simple and subtle thing, but it might be, at least in my opinion, the best part of this paper, because it shows that with machine learning, we may be able to learn algorithms that are more efficient than our current RL algorithms with this very simple trick. That being said, when I was first looking at this, I was a bit skeptical. And that's because a distributed model that only updates after every in episodes is likely not a very efficient way of learning if we care about sample efficiency. So if you're like me, you might be wondering, can we still do this with a more efficient algorithm. If we use something that does not do this distributed training, will we still get the same results? And luckily, if we actually scroll down a bit, we can see that the authors thought of the same thing. We have these results from figure six to answer this. In this figure, you are seeing A3C with only one actor, no parallel training in the green compared to AD and red. This time though, instead of having multiple actors and only taking the history of one, we're taking every 10th episode from the source algorithm's single stream history. Looking at the source algorithm, as I surmise, we could definitely say it learns a lot Lot faster when it's updating more frequently. However, with this subsampling technique, AD is still able to learn quite a bit faster, which is great to see. It means that even when we have a bit more efficient of an algorithm, we can still get these much faster learning benefits simply by subsampling from our original history. Now, this is impressive, though there are still two things on note. One thing is that although it's not visible in this figure, the authors mention that with enough training, the source algorithm does eventually surpass AD in the limit. So while AD is quicker to learn, it has a lower performance seal. And the second thing is not from the paper, but just some of my thoughts. And that's that this experiment shows that the speed at which AD can learn is very impressive. But even a single stream A3C algorithm is still, I think, far off from the most sample efficient algorithms we have in reinforcement learning. If, for example, you take a look at algorithms used in the Atari 100K benchmark, and for anyone familiar with that, yes, the Atari 100K benchmark has some glaring issues, but even so, I would take a guess and say that those algorithms would probably be more efficient than what we're seeing here. Some of the much simpler methods used in Atari 100K update at every single step, and because of that are able to be significantly more efficient than other algorithms. Now, this is not to discount the results here, because I think this direction of work, the idea of learning an RL algorithm is really interesting, and these results and experiments are pretty solid. I mention this more to say that this paper alone is not proof that AD is going to be able to improve performance of any RL algorithm we throw at it, uh, which again is not a problem, just a comment about where the current limitations of this paper lie. Now that I uh, got that off by chest, though, let's get back into some more of these results going into figure five here. In figure five, the authors look at whether AD can be prompted. Essentially, the idea is that if we say prompt AD with some rollouts that are already 25% or 50% optimal, can it use that as a starting point to keep improving? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, as you can see, all of these prompts allow it to keep improving to around its near peak performance level. This is, I think, expected given what we've seen so far, but I think these results are here more so just to say, hey, this is also another thing you can do with this. And looking at some of the final results down here in figure seven, we can see an ablation showing how much the model improves with a larger context length. And what we're seeing here is that with a small context length, the model does poorly. And with a larger context, it does quite well. The notable takeaway here is where we can see a pretty giant gap between a context size of one and two episodes. And this likely occurs because once the model can see a significant portion of more than one episode, it's able to learn how the model has improved between episodes. The whole point here is that we're learning what changes from episode to episode. So if your context isn't capturing that, well, it makes sense that the model is going to perform poorly, right? And with that, we actually arrive at the conclusion and overall thoughts about this work. In the conclusion, the authors mentioned that the main limitation of this work is that most RL environments have long horizons and transformers are limited in how much context that they can hold. Well, that's definitely one direction that could help improve this work. I think, funny enough, they're actually overlooking another solution, one that is at least more natural in my head. And that is instead of having massive episodes with infrequent updates, why not just take a continual learning approach here? In continual learning, or at least the definition from where I'm at, the ideal is that agents update at every time step instead of just at the end of every episode. This not only has the potential benefits of making your algorithms more efficient and fitting into the real world where, you know, episodes aren't always a thing, but in the case of AD, it could also help by making the required context length much lower because you no longer need to catch episode to episode dynamics, but rather you just need to capture step to step dynamics.
That's the main portion of this paper covered. If you are interested in taking a look at this yourself, there is still more. There are some discussions I didn't quite cover and a thorough appendix that, for example, talks about how many different tasks are actually required to learn in our algorithm, which it's a lot, by the way. Uh, or they also talk about some tricks required to get transformers to work this well or some other stuff like that. Overall, I think this is a great paper, and I'm really excited for this direction of work. I will certainly be looking forward to see where this goes. And if you found this interesting, consider subscribing to get more like this. Also consider checking out my Twitter if you want some of my hot takes and memes. With that, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to catch you next time.